And that was actually the talk, so <laughs> it's just uh, pretty, pretty simple there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, okay, there we go. It could just be all Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, OK, so, uh, so, so, okay. so the, the, you know, the, this work is like, uh, it, it's more on the conceptual side than anything else, OK? Uh, but it's, it's motivated by something that's, that's really coming down the pike. So uh, I, I'd like to kind of give you a sense of what's coming down the pike, and then hopefully you know, we can discuss these ideas. Um, so uh, you know, high level, uh, you know, as we sort of think about you know, one model of sort of uh, fairness in sort of algorithmic decision making, is kind of the picture of the bottom, right? You have data. Uh, you, know, you have some algorithm built on top of the data. The algorithm takes some, some, some sort of decision. And in some sort of normative way, we view that as either good or bad or whatever, right? Um, you know, often when we have problems with the decision the algorithms make, you can kind of trace those problems all the way back to the data itself, right? So in particular, uh, you know, I'm highlighting just one example from uh, precision oncology. Uh, well, this is pretty well known in the space, uh, where the data sets tend to be largely focused on certain uh, ethnic groups. And as such, when you look at the efficacy of the algorithms you build, well, obviously, you know, they're going to they're, they're ex exhibit uh, sort of disparities. So at a high level, right, we could kind of think about fixing this by sort of fixing the algorithm. But you're looking at this and you're saying, well, that, that's not fixing the root cause, because it's not, right? The root cause over here uh, would be instead, what you need to do is collect more data, right? And uh, in particular, uh, you know, there's a large community of people uh, working on online learning, right? Where as opposed to the data set being, uh, shall we say, like static, right? There's this, there's this sort of loop, right? Your, your data is constantly being updated, uh, and you're, you're actively seeking to figure out, you know, what data should I acquire? What data maybe, I, you know, do I not need? Uh, 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 and, and, and so forth, OK? Um, I am particularly interested in sort of the applications of this, this sort of framework in modern clinical trials. OK, so one of the things, as I said, there's something coming down the pike, right? So one of the things that uh, you know, I believe is, is, is just going to become sort of de facto in the next 10 years is a move from the current way of doing clinical trials to what are today called uh, platform trials. A platform trial is, broadly speaking, uh, something like this, where, uh, you know, to the, to, let's say, to, to those that are familiar with this area, what you're doing is, as opposed to kind of a fixed design experiment, you're running something of a multi-arm bandit. Okay, the idea being that you have a whole bunch of these treatments, uh, and you sort of explore and exploit uh, with these treatments across your population. Okay, so I'm, I'm being very fast and loose here. Why is this move going to happen? This move is going to happen because actually what I was talking about at the top, right? Today, as drug companies actually think about you know, drugs they want to actually put out, right? The indications for these drugs, the target populations, are getting slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. So for instance, if you think about a blockbuster drug from a company like Merck, like Keytruda, right? Uh, Merck is exploring, actually, through a platform trial, right? Various uses of Keytruda in combination with a whole bunch of other things to target very, very fine you know, parts of the population. And a typical sort of trial design won't work. OK, so, so this sort of online kind of learning thing uh, you know, it's happening in lots of domains, one of them clinical trials. Okay? So high level, right, what's the upside of all of this? The upside is uh, you know, you know, if, I'm, if I'm kind of updating the data set continuously, I can kind of collect the right data. Uh, and hopefully, I don't get into the problem we, you know, we had on the first slide, right? where we over-index on certain groups, under-index on certain other groups. Um, the downside of all of this is uh, I'm, I'm effectively also experimenting. Right? And a natural question to ask is, well, if you're experimenting, who bears the cost of that experimentation? Right? Like, you don't want to be the, think of it from a clinical trial perspective. The reason it's taken so long for platform trials to become a thing is that nobody wants to less necessarily be at the whims of like, an algorithm experimenting. Right? You don't want to be that, that unit that was uh, you know, the coin flip. Right? Um, and so what I, what I want to do in this work, as I said, it's sort of more conceptual than anything. Uh, is I want to sort of formalize what fairness means in this sort of context. OK, I want to put out like a, a, a proposal for perhaps a systematic way of thinking about you know, who bears the cost of exploration 
in this context. Okay, so that's that's kind of the work in a nutshell. Uh, oops, um, trying to figure out how to go back here. There we go. So for whatever reason, the animation died, but that's okay. All right. So uh, this slide was meant to be animated, but. Uh, just to kind of get like a sense of like this is a cartoon of a platform trial, okay? So so think of it as follows, right? Uh, you have a patient that gets enrolled in the trial. Let's say that patient is that first person over there. Uh, that patient has a whole bunch of information, right? That information could be you know things about the patient, their medical history, what have you. Let's call that X one. Uh, and then you know you have this platform trial running. It's running a quote unquote bandit. Think of it as some experiment, right? some experimental algorithm. It chooses, let's say in this case, a dosage of warfarin for this particular patient. Okay? You see what happens with the patient. By the way, there's some issues there because sometimes it takes time to see what happens, but let's put that aside. Right? Uh, and then your second patient comes along. Right? And your second patient's patient two over there. You know, with information X2, you decide, you know, uh, should I give, you know, what should I give this per person? And the, the, game, the game continues. Okay? Now, uh, if you sort of think about the efficacy of you know, what you're doing, we're going to say that that efficacy is sort of a function of the, you know, of the patient. It's a function of x. Um, and it's also a function of what you choose to do with that patient. Right? So at a high level, uh, this is what's called a contextual bandit problem. Okay? So this is a contextual bandit. And just for simplicity, everything I'm going to talk about will be for a linear contextual bandit, but that, there's nothing special about that. Okay? Now, uh, looking at this picture a little bit more, right, you'll notice the crosses and the, the, the check marks, right? And so let's say after the fact, after you've done this for a long time, uh, you, know, you, you know what the right thing to do is, right? And it turns out that in hindsight, you did the wrong thing for patient one and patient four. You did the right thing for patients two, three, and five, okay? Now, I've also colored the patients here, right? Like, uh, why, you know, those two patients are orange, the other two are blue. Let's say the orange patients and the blue patients belong to certain groups. Let's say a racial group or something like that, right? So let's say the orange patients were, you know, looked at this. They may come back and say, hey, wait a second. Like, we bore the brunt of, 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 of all of this experimentation, right? Everybody else kind of benefited from this. And that doesn't quite, uh, you know, that doesn't quite feel, uh, that doesn't quite feel right. Okay, so let's, let's take this a little bit further, okay? And let's put some numbers to this. So it turns out that uh, you know, there's, there's a publicly available Warfarin data set that you can kind of play with. And so what we did is we said, let's simulate what a platform trial would look like using that Warfarin data set. So we know what the, the ground truth is. We know what's going to be good. So we can kind of play out what might actually happen. Right? Um, so if you look at this, right, um, and you kind of normalize in an appropriate way the number of mistakes you made between these two racial groups. Group A and Group B. It turns out that the data set has more groups, but I'm going to restrict to two, groups A and Group B, right? If either group were on their own, right, they'd sort of see a normalized sort of rate of mistakes of 75, whatever that number is. Okay, don't, don't worry about the absolute scale of the number. Just look at, the, look at it relative to each other, right? Now, when they're both, they're, they're both part of the same sort of experiment, each group benefits from learning from the other group, right? And as such, the number of mistakes you see for each group goes down. For group A, it goes down from 75 mistakes to something like six mistakes. For group B, it goes down from 78 point something odd mistakes to 72 mistakes. So group, both groups benefited, right? Uh, but they benefited in a, by the way, all my animations are broken for some reason, so I, I, I apologize for the, the jumpiness of this. Um, anyways, they both benefited. But the extent of the benefit is quite different across these two groups, right? Group A's reduction in regret was, let's call it 70, right? 70 units of regret. Group B's reduction of regret was 6, OK? So I'm going to normalize the regret on their own to 0, OK? Just to kind of build a, pic a picture of this, right? So if I take that blue dot regret on its own and I normalize that to 0, and I look at you know, what the improvement was for group A and group B, Right? You'll see that, hey, you know, group A improved by 68.9, group B improved by whatever, 5.9. Now, natural, the natural question to ask is, is this fair right? in some sense? And like, a reasonable answer to is it fair is, well, it depends on what, what else was possible. Right? So if the only other thing possible was, let's say, the red dot, then you say, yeah, I mean, this is great. Right? Like, both groups do, this is the best thing we can get for both these groups. 
right? Uh, but it may not just be the red dot, right? So conceptually, you might say, well, hey, look, if I look across the space of algorithms, right, uh, the set of outcomes for this sort of utility gain for these two groups might look like anything in this sort of red set over here, OK? And now once we actually can kind of, and, and I've drawn it to be a nice looking set, and it doesn't actually have, and it doesn't actually have to be nice looking, right? Um, but, but conceptually, right, the problem, we, we've now reduced this problem to sort of saying, look, uh, I can sort of think about fairness as a question of kind of picking a point over here in terms of what's achievable in terms of regret reduction across these groups, all right? But once I have this, I can ask, all, I can do all sorts of things, right? And this ties to, I think, one of the talks in the morning where you know, somebody was talking about uh, you know, utilities across groups. Right? Same story over here, OK? So now imagine for a quick second right, that I, I can somehow enumerate the set. I can somehow talk about this set, right? Uh, what I want to do is pick a canonical point within that set, right? Now, there are many ways of picking a canonical point. Just for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to pick one. Right? But you don't have to pick this one. You can pick something else. Okay? So the one I'm going to pick is something called the Nash solution. Roughly speaking, what does the Nash solution do? It's basically going to pick a point that says, well, at this point, it's going to be impossible for me to sort of improve somebody by, let's say, 10% without hurting somebody by more than a relative sort of 10%. Okay? It would have to be that at that point, if somebody improved you know, from their baseline by 10%, somebody's going to sort of get hurt by more than 10%. Okay, that's, that's kind of roughly what, what goes on with this Nash point. Okay, so let's just take a step back, right? The game over here was to sort of say, we've got, uh, you know, we've got all these groups in the platform trial, right? Bunch of different, let's say a bunch of different races. And we want to ask who bears the cost of exploration, who bears the brunt of exploration, right? And the way I'm sort of proposing we might think about that, right? is to think about it from the perspective of across the space of all algorithms, I can think about what's achievable in terms of regret reduction across all these groups. And now I can fall back, for instance, on, let's say, a solution like the Nash solution to pick a point within that group in a principled fashion. Okay? Now, if I do this, so, so what am I saying? It's, I think this is the last slide that actually has any math on it, but it's not really meaningful math, right? So what am I saying? Roughly speaking, what I'd like to do if, if I wa wanted to come up with sort of a fair algorithm, is quite simply pick an algorithm that in this set of outcomes achieved a point that maximized a certain objective. In this case, it's the sum of the logs of the, incre of the utilities. Right? If you thought about what a typical, and now this is important, if you thought about what a typical optimal algorithm might do in this case, it would simply maximize the sum of the utilities. That's equivalent to a regret optimal algorithm, OK? So, so let's just take a pause here. What are we doing? We're saying, look, there's this vast literature on online learning, right? If I thought about what regret optimality means in that literature, regret optimality, when viewed through this lens, is simply maximizing the sum of the utility gains, OK? And what I'm saying is, well, that may or may not be unfair, right? When we look at that Warfarin example, it doesn't look, look so promising. So perhaps what we need to do is to think about a better allocation of utilities, a better split of that burden of exploration across these groups. OK, so the questions that I want to ask here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the answers. If you're interested in this, you can look at it, right? Is question one, you know, can you even solve that first thing? And it turns out it's a resounding yes. You can solve it. In fact, at some level, the key ideas to solve this were done like 25 years ago. OK, so it's, it's not that hard to solve. A more interesting question, actually, to me personally, is when you do this sort of regret optimal, like, is this even a problem? Right? Like, am I making up a problem here? So in particular, if you did sort of like a typical platform trial, the way they're set up to run, something that's regret optimal, is that going to be unfair? Right? Is that naturally going to be unfair? Or are we going to luck out, and is it just going to be fine? Right? And then you can, for instance, ask, are there trade-offs between these things? So let's just focus on that second question. right? Uh, so how fair right, are regret optimal policies? Right, so basically, I set up a platform trial. I ignore issues of fairness. right? I just run the trial. Uh, what could happen to all of the, you know, could, could, we, could we see outcomes that don't look so good? Um, 
the rough answer, and I can make this answer, I mean, there's empirical, plenty of empirical evidence of this, but there's like sort of very pretty theoretical evidence of this as well. So it turns out that under any regret optimal policy, okay, under any regret optimal policy, there's always going to be a group that essentially gets basically no improvement from being part of, uh, you know, of this collective learning process. Effectively speaking, what we're saying is there's always going to be a group that gets free ridden on. Okay, now, now it turns out, which, which to me was very surprising as a result. Okay, but it turns out yeah, this, is, this is true. Now, the intuition behind this is actually really, really simple, right? So, so by the way, what are we saying here? What we're saying over here is if you just did a regret optimal algorithm, right, an algorithm that looks good from an online learning perspective, it's likely going to look terrible from a fairness perspective, okay? Now, what is the intuition for this? The intuition for this is actually really, really simple and very cute. Okay, so imagine for a quick second you had two groups, A and B, and three treatments. Okay, so the treatments are theta 2, theta 1, and theta 3. Okay, and let's say group A only has access to theta 2 and theta 1. And group B has access to, uh, you know, uh, 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 yes, uh, group A only has access to theta 2 and theta 1. Group B has access to theta 2 and theta 3. Okay. Let's say furthermore, right, that we know what theta 1 and theta 3 are with certainty. So the only thing that's unknown, the only thing we're experimenting with, right, and, and this is, by the way, very realistic, right? Think of that as a new drug being thrown into the platform trial. Okay, so conceptually, it's, it's, it's meaningful, right? So if theta 2 is this new drug being thrown into the platform trial, who's going to actually experiment on theta 2? Well, it's not shocking that it's going to be A at the end of the day. Because A's best alternative was theta 1, B's best alternative was theta 3, why would I take a risk with group B? I'd rather take the risk with group A. Okay? And so this is kind of what drives this sort of unfairness, right? This is the, the net of what drives this sort of unfairness. Okay. So, right, so, so point number one, if you just did something regret optimal in a platform trial, you're going to get really unfair outcomes at the end of the day. So if somebody kind of reviewed the results of the trial, right, after the fact, you might, uh, you might well find that there is one group that actually bore the brunt of all the experimentation. That's not good. So now uh, another question you could sort of ask is, um, can we even find this? Right? Can we, can we, can we you know, come up with fair policies? And uh, short answer is yes. What I want to show you is how well the, you know, such a policy might actually do. Right? So back to that sort of warfarin picture, and now my animations are working. Right? Uh, this, is, this is what happened earlier. Right? Basically, we saw that you know, group A uh, you know, kind of improved by a lot. Group B did not improve by a lot. And so we could say, well, hey, like if you kind of did this fair sort of exploration, uh, you know, what is that improvement? Can, you, can we balance out the improvement? It turns out that you can compute this Nash thing exactly. right? And it turns out that what it does is, at the end of the day, it balances out the utility gain across these two groups. The other thing worth noting is look at the total utility between the groups. Right? You'd imagine that there's a price to pay for actually being fair. Right? That is to say, if I'm not doing something regret optimal, there's going to be a hit to efficiency. Right? There's going to be a hit to regret. But what we see here is that hit to regret is actually not that large. Okay? The hit to regret is actually not that large in this, in, this, uh, in this particular picture. And that leads to kind of a third question, which is, you know, are these fair, you know, are these efficient policies fair? Right? And the short answer over there is actually as long as you don't have too many groups, uh, and this builds on kind of older work that was, I was involved in, uh, right? if you don't have too many groups, you can get uniform bounds for how, for how fair they are. Okay? So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, in summary, um, here are the, sort of the key things I want you guys to take away. Right? So one is that you know, online, online learning, this process of collecting new data, is sort of becoming increasingly common in sort of high stakes decisions. My, my focus was on platform trials where I sort of know something about that space. Right? In that space, a, a, a big question that's kind of get, getting asked as folks try to get more and more platform trials approved is sort of who bears this cost of exploration. Uh, there were two big points that we saw. One, if you kind of stick with the current way of doing these things, which is basically regret optimal policies, these policies can be quite unfair. And there's a structural reason for why this unfairness exists. It's not like some random empirical fact. Right? But then on the positive side, 
fair solutions are actually reasonably efficient, and you can actually do these things. Okay, so let me let me actually quit here with ten seconds left. Uh, yep, thank you. Question? Uh, either of you. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Very nice talk. Uh, when I heard about uh, this work on f incentivizing fair, fair exploration across different groups, I was wondering if the decision should not be with the algorithm designer, but rather with people, whether they want to engage in giving their data or, or engage in a clinical trial, let's say, and be paid for that. Like, be paid for the group difference, because you know, if, if I know that my data is very unique, why, why shouldn't I get paid for it to uh, participate in an experiment? Yeah, 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 totally. So I, I, I don't think these are mutually exclusive, right? So I think you can have sort of a market-driven view of this, which is, I think, what you're talking about. Right. right? And there are probably settings where a market-driven view is, is kind of the right view, right? Uh, I think the, satellite, the setting I have in mind is, is fundamentally kind of like a, one where there is a sort of centralized decision maker. Mm -hmm. Right? In this case, the centralized decision maker is the body that's approving the trial design. Right. Right? And so it's kind of up to them to kind of figure out, hey, you know, how do I want to actually do this? And so there is a centralized decision. So once you kind of have that centralized decision maker in place, mm -hmm. you can fall back on sort of some of the things I was talking about. Right? But I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think it depends on context. Thank you. Thank you.